I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a video for my professional responsibility class about ABA Model Rule 1.10, which deals with conflicts of interest and screening lawyers, and when conflicts are imputed to an entire firm. So let's dive in. This is part one of two videos um, that I'm going to do about this rule. In this one, we're going to go through the rule provisions very quickly. And um, in the next video, I'm going to uh, go over some of the comments that I think are likely to appear as test questions. Now, I also have to say something about this rule. I really encourage my students to take a look at this rule, and if you haven't, and read the um, actual text of the rule very carefully. I find that this particular rule is um, has very long, confusing sentences. So what I've done is sort of paraphrased it to try to make it clearer and easier for students to learn the rule. So let's dive in here. Our main takeaway is that if any lawyer in a firm has a conflict of interest under rules 1.7 or 1.9, the conflict, the default rule, is that it's going to be imputed to the entire firm. So when we talk about imputation, we mean that one lawyer's conflict applies to all the lawyers in the firm, especially if it's under 1.7 or 1.9. Now, if it's a personal conflict of interest for the lawyer under 1.7, or due to a lawyer's prior firm uh, under 1.9, especially B, the firm can screen the affected lawyer to solve it. And so, now remember, we also had a conflict of Rule 1.8 that was a lot of uh, personal conflicts of interest of the lawyer, and that rule has its own imputation and uh, screening uh, rule at the end of 1.8. So here we're talking about imputation and screening for 1.7, which is sort of the main conflicts of interest rule with current clients, and uh, 1.9, which is about prior clients. Now notice in the, our second bullet point here that if it's just a personal conflict of interest, like um, let's say that uh, the client, new client of the firm is a, an ex-partner of yours, um, a, an ex-spouse or something like that, um, or someone that you have a bad history with, then you could be screened because that's just a personal conflict of interest under 1.7. It's a material limitation conflict and another lawyer in your firm can handle the matter. And that's gonna be true as well as if you change firms and your new firm is representing a client whose interests are adverse to a client you represented at your prior firm. So we're gonna talk about screening the affected lawyer. But also keep in mind that some of the conflicts of interest that are about being directly adverse under 1.7, you can't cure just by screening the lawyers from each other in the firm, as we'll um, see in the following provisions. So what do we mean by screening? Well, this means that the firm isolates the attorney uh, um, who has a conflict of interest from any participation in a matter by implementing procedures. The procedures kind of need to be um, adopted before this situation arises to prevent the lawyer from disclosing pr any protected information or exerting any influence on the other lawyer, uh, uh, lawyers in the firm and there's no share of the fees with the affected lawyer. Now, of course, if you're receiving a salary from the firm, uh, that doesn't apply. But if your firm is somehow uh, going to divide up uh, the contingent fees or whatever they get and each lawyer gets a percentage, um, then <laughs> it won't apply uh, to you in this case if you're being screened. They're supposed to uh, prevent that. So what does this mean, uh, screening the lawyer? It means that um, you are, uh, everyone is told that you are being screened, so they shouldn't talk to you about the case or ask you about the case. You have an ethical duty not to tell anyone anything about the case or share any files or documents or um, anything like that that could divulge or disclose confidential information. If there's meetings um, where they're discussing, you're not gonna go to the meetings. If you're in a meeting of uh, some attorneys and they start discussing a case that you're supposed to be screened from, you should get up and leave. You're supposed to leave the room. And um, at some firms, they will even instruct the whoever is running their computer network to block your access to the files of um, clients whose cases you're supposed to be screened from. Uh, so every firm, it doesn't spell out exactly what um, procedures 
are supposed to be implemented, but there are sort of prevailing practices or best practices in the legal industry. Now, screening also requires the firm to give prompt notice. So screening, we have screening and notice of the affected clients um, to any affected former client of the lawyer so that that party can ascertain compliance with the rule. And this notice has to describe the firm's screening procedures and certify compliance by the firm and the lawyer to those procedures. So note here that when we're talking about screening a lawyer to cure an imputed conflict of interest, we don't have to go and get the uh, former client's consent. Now we're going to get to that, that that is an option but actually you can, if you're going to screen the lawyer, you can just tell the former client that you uh, have a lawyer at your firm who, uh, let's say, used to work for their law firm and that you have implemented um, in your, uh, various screening procedures. You're going to detail what those are and you're going to give assurance or pr promises that the firm is following these protocols as is the affected lawyer. And so you're going to describe the procedures and certify this. And the idea here is that we want the affected party to be able to look at your procedures and compare it to the requirements of the rule and make sure that you are actually complying and protecting their legal interests. Now, the notice about the screening must also inform the party that judicial review may be available. And that's usually all you have to say. If you have a question about this, um, you can ask for a judicial review of our screening procedures. And, and obviously, if the judge finds that they're inadequate, then your firm could be subject to disqualification. The firm has to also promise to respond promptly to written inquiries or objections about screening procedures. And I have to tell you, some of the cases about this I've seen in the last few years were actually um, litigation scenarios where uh, the one firm hired away a paralegal from the other party's firm uh, and in basically with bad intentions with in hopes that that paralegal would divulge confidential information about the opposing party and so the firm uh, initially raises some con uh, some concerns or objects to this the firm that hired the person starts to uh, 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 implement screening procedures before any confidential information is shared. But then later on, as the litigation progresses, the other party starts to get the idea that maybe um, they've developed some leaks or they're not still really following their screening procedures very carefully, um, be maybe because the lawyers there seem to know information they couldn't have otherwise known if they hadn't, uh, if it hadn't been disclosed by the, uh, the person who was supposed to be screened, in which case they can check in and ask for an update. Are you still screening um, this person from involvement in the matter? Now, both the partner and the firm, at the firm and the lawyer have to provide certification and compliance with the rules and the screening procedures. Um, and then it re and they have to do this uh, basically at least twice um, at the beginning and then at maybe at reasonable intervals if the client former client requests it for example they have some reason that they're concerned that you're not really following this and then basically at the end of the matter when the screening procedures end so you're definitely going to have to do it um, at the beginning when we know that there's a conflict, we've identified it. And then at the end, when we decide, okay, we no longer have to screen this person um, because basically the matter is involved or our firm is no longer involved and so on. And in between, you have to, if the other uh, party requests it reasonably. Now they can't harass you with daily requests for certification or probably even weekly requests, but from time to time at reasonable intervals, if they're asking for updates, hey, we would like some assurances that you're still screening this lawyer who has a conflict of interest um, with our uh, client, then you have to provide that. And it's both a partner at the firm and the affected lawyer. Now, after a lawyer leaves a firm, this is 1.10b, the firm may thereafter represent a person with interests materially adverse to those of a client of the lawyer who left, assuming the firm no longer represents that client, unless it's the same or substantially related matter, or if anyone still at the firm has confidential information material to the matter. So, 
please notice that um, if you leave a firm and you take your clients with you, that uh, the firm you leave behind, if they don't have anyone there who still has confidential information about your former clients, and it's not the same matter, they can in the future represent clients who with adverse legal interests to um, those clients, even though it used to be a client of their firm and you are continuing to represent that client. So you represent Greenacre. Greenacre is really your client while you're working at a firm. You switch to a new firm or start to leave that firm to start your own practice and take your clients with you, including Greenacre. Well, your old firm can in the future represent someone without even asking for consent. Uh, to who has adverse legal interests to Greenacre because Greenacre is no longer a client of the firm and as long as we can satisfy this we're not switching sides the firm isn't switching sides in the same matter um, or substantially related matter and um, we don't have people at the firm who still possess confidential information about it. Now, I'm going to cover C and D very quickly. Don't give up on me. C, disqualification provide, provided by this rule may be waived by the affected client under the conditions stated in Rule 1.7. What does that mean? That means informed consent confirmed in writing. So if the uh, other client does, um, doesn't care, that, so they say, I, I don't really care that you have that lawyer from my firm working for you now. I don't think they know anything or that, um, that they don't aren't going to be able to be very helpful. If they give informed consent confirmed in writing, they can waive the conflict, in which case uh, we don't really care about screening and notice. And then D basically just says this rule doesn't apply to government lawyers, we're gonna have a whole separate standalone rule. That's the next rule, rule 1.11, disqualification of lawyers associated in a firm with former or current government lawyers is governed by rule 1.11. So it's very common that we have lawyers um, uh, leaving, uh, being, who are government lawyers who leave and go into private practice. We're gonna have a whole standalone rule about those types of conflicts and screening those lawyers and 1.10 doesn't apply, that rule does instead. And um, I have a quick review question. I, I know this is tedious um, to make sure you are paying attention. If a lawyer at a firm has a conflict of interest with a firm's prospective new client, may other lawyers in the firm represent the client instead? A, yes, so long as the lawyer in um, conflict is screened in time, or no, because the lawyer's conflicts of interest will be imputed to the rest of the firm. Now, that's supposed to be an easy question. If you don't know the answer, you probably uh, zoned out a little bit and weren't uh, paying attention to the video and you should rewatch this video. And But that concludes this uh, video about ABA Model Rule 1.10. Don't give up. We have another video where we're going to talk about some of the most important comments.